Now open your question paper and look at part one. You will hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. They have been around for about 350 million years. They are very beautiful, even though they spend years underwater as space monster lookalikes. They can fly across continents and oceans, yet they are in danger of becoming extinct. The National Dragonfly Museum, with its team of volunteer wildlife helpers, is dedicated to ensuring that the dragonfly survives and thrives. As the guiding spirit and chairman of the museum puts it in the brochure, they have been around 350 times longer than we have and now, because of us and our pollution, dragonflies are having a hard time. But let's not sit back clutching our eco-guilt. There are things we can do. As many as 200 dragonfly spotters turn up on any open day during the summer. But there's no telling which species will show up from one day to the next, it all depends on the weather. Dragonflies refuse to fly in overcast conditions. They sulk. Nevertheless, dragonfly action can go on with lectures, exhibitions and videos throughout the day. Fans of the horror film Alien can treat themselves to a frisson of recognition by watching a widescreen projection of dragonfly larvae snatching and devouring prey. Not a spectacle for the squeamish. They have been around for about 350 million years. They are very beautiful, even though they spend years underwater as space monster lookalikes. They can fly across continents and oceans, yet they are in danger of becoming extinct. The National Dragonfly Museum, with its team of volunteer wildlife helpers, is dedicated to ensuring that the dragonfly survives and thrives. As the guiding spirit and chairman of the museum puts it in the brochure, they have been around 350 times longer than we have and now, because of us and our pollution, dragonflies are having a hard time. But let's not sit back clutching our eco-guilt. There are things we can do. As many as 200 dragonfly spotters turn up on any open day during the summer. But there's no telling which species will show up from one day to the next, it all depends on the weather. Dragonflies refuse to fly in overcast conditions. They sulk. Nevertheless, dragonfly action can go on with lectures, exhibitions and videos throughout the day. Fans of the horror film Alien can treat themselves to a frisson of recognition by watching a widescreen projection of dragonfly larvae snatching and devouring prey. Not a spectacle for the squeamish. Extract 2 Richie Stokowski is still in his teens, but already he has made his fortune. Several million dollars, earned with a sort of entrepreneurial brainwave that commands respect as well as envy. He had an idea for a novel swimming pool toy, a walkie-talkie he called the Water Talkie. It was an instant hit. There is no doubt that the water talkie was Richie's idea, and grown-up toy makers testify that he has a gift for new ideas. The concept just popped into his head, he says, while he was snorkeling with his dad in the sea off Hawaii. I saw all this amazing stuff down there, and I really wanted to talk about it with my dad while we were swimming along. And then I thought, hey, 
Why don't we invent something so that we can talk underwater? The snag he thought was that all the wires and batteries of a walkie-talkie would get wet. My granddad was a big navy guy, and he was on submarines or something. So my dad said he might know how to do it. He put us onto sonar underwater acoustics. I was really surprised to learn that sound works better underwater. Richie went on to have a hand in making sure the toy looked nice, and the water talkie was promptly sold to some of the world's biggest toy retailers. Richie Stokowski is still in his teens, but already he has made his fortune. Several million dollars, earned with a sort of entrepreneurial brainwave that commands respect as well as envy. He had an idea for a novel swimming pool toy, a walkie-talkie he called the Water Talkie. It was an instant hit. There is no doubt that the water talkie was Richie's idea, and grown-up toy makers testify that he has a gift for new ideas. The concept just popped into his head, he says, while he was snorkeling with his dad in the sea off Hawaii. I saw all this amazing stuff down there, and I really wanted to talk about it with my dad while we were swimming along. And then I thought, hey, why don't we invent something so that we can talk underwater? The snag, he thought, was that all the wires and batteries of a walkie-talkie would get wet. My granddad was a big Navy guy, and he was on submarines or something. So my dad said he might know how to do it. He put us onto sonar underwater acoustics. I was really surprised to learn that sound works better underwater. Richie went on to have a hand in making sure the toy looked nice, and the water talkie was promptly sold to some of the world's biggest toy retailers. Extract 3 You could argue that there are similarities between fiction and cookbook writing. My own book certainly attempts to be a work of evocation. But in a sense, this is the case even with more picture-led and less word-driven enterprises too. Just as in the novel, what is attempted is the portrayal of a life, a world, a series of values, aspirations, emotions. You might also say that this world that is evoked, this series of values, is indeed and most emphatically a fiction. For it is hardly difficult to notice that there is something of a disparity between cookbook culture, real food, lovingly created, lingeringly appreciated, and real life. To be frank, this disparity alone would be enough to explain the cookbook obsession. We no longer really lead domestic lives. We are work creatures. We live in offices. Naturally, then, our desires turn to the home. That is why there is such a proliferation of writing on cooking and interior decoration. Words have to make up for the shortfall in deeds. <laughs> Don't be fooled by cookbook consumption. Reading about food is what you do instead of cooking it. We are talking vicarious gratification here. You could argue that there are similarities between fiction and cookbook writing. My own book certainly attempts to be a work of evocation. But in a sense, this is the case even with more picture-led and less word-driven enterprises too. Just as in the novel, what is attempted is the portrayal of a life, a world, a series of values, aspirations, emotions... You might also say that this world that is evoked, this series of values, is indeed and most emphatically a fiction. For it is hardly difficult to notice that there is something of a disparity between cookbook culture, real food, lovingly created, lingeringly appreciated, and real life. To be frank, this disparity alone would be enough to explain the cookbook obsession. We no longer really lead domestic lives. We are work creatures. We live in offices.
Naturally, then, our desires turn to the home. That is why there is such a proliferation of writing on cooking and interior decoration. Words have to make up for the shortfall in deeds. <laughs> Don't be fooled by cookbook consumption. Reading about food is what you do instead of cooking it. We are talking vicarious gratification here. That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You will hear part of a talk about shopping centres. For questions seven to fifteen. Complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have forty-five seconds in which to look at part two. My name, as you probably know, is David Peak. I act as a consultant to the developers of shopping centres, advising their architects and designers on what makes customers switch their loyalties from an existing store and travel sometimes relatively long distances to a new one. It's rather a fancy term, but I'm what is known as a consumer behaviourist. Now. There are two fundamental questions when it comes to building a shopping centre. First, is the money there? And second, how do we get it as opposed to somebody else? The answer is to make people feel comfortable and enthusiastic about the proposition. Increasingly, as shoppers become more discerning and competition increases, this means focusing on things such as safety, air quality, light, and choice of materials. What I call Total sensory design, as well as perennially important things such as value and service, I've identified twelve key stages the shopper goes through from leaving the comfort of the couch to returning home, which need to be de-stressed. I begin my work miles away from the site, since research indicates that problems getting to a shopping centre make people regard the whole experience as negative. Too many roundabouts on the drive there are, I've found, stressful for women. They also don't like litter in the surrounding areas. Research has also indicated that people want 25% more space round their cars in the car park to manoeuvre pushchairs and trolleys. In terms of the materials used within a shopping centre, the flooring materials are especially important. Shiny surfaces are out because they can be slippery and make people afraid of falling. I've found that people inevitably gravitate towards natural materials. They may admire plastic and steel for their design qualities, but they develop relationships with stone and wood. They're much more expensive, but I'm convinced that they make people think of a location with them as superior. Now, what if people just feel that a place is not for them? What if the pensioners hate the designer clothes and loud music designed for people in their twenties? Well, I've thought of this problem, of course. In my view, people like to shop with like-minded people, what I call people like us, or PLUs for short. So, in the latest shopping centre I've been involved with, shops are grouped in what I refer to as PLU clusters, so that people likely to be drawn to one sort of shop will not feel threatened by people drawn to another. Thus, the centre has the exclusive mall and the discount mall, and shoppers visiting one of them need never meet shoppers going to the other. My research has identified six consumer types. For example, there are those who respond to understated presentation, which enables them to pride themselves on their shrewdness. These I call county classics. Pensioners and people who have stopped competing in their careers fall into another category. Home comfortables. 
Then there are people who look out for some code which tells them a place is for them and not for others. I call them club executives. They want comfort and value, not aesthetics. Another category covers people who don't have huge spending power but always think they're going to find a bargain. The budget optimists. Then there are what I call young fashionables, who lack analytical skills but know what they want when they see it and go for it voraciously. And finally, there are couples just married with one income and just about getting by, who I call young survivors. People sometimes ask me if I ever feel guilty about making people spend money they don't want to spend. What I say is that I have a strong aversion to conning people. I believe that to earn money in the retail business, you must give outstanding value. Now, that brings me on to my next point, which concerns the general fiscal policy. Now you'll hear part two again. My name, as you probably know, is David Peake. I act as a consultant to the developers of shopping centres, advising their architects and designers on what makes customers switch their loyalties from an existing store and travel sometimes relatively long distances to a new one. It's rather a fancy term, but I'm what is known as a consumer behaviourist. Now, there are two fundamental questions when it comes to building a shopping centre. First, is the money there? And second, how do we get it as opposed to somebody else? The answer is to make people feel comfortable and enthusiastic about the proposition. Increasingly, as shoppers become more discerning and competition increases, this means focusing on things such as safety, air quality, light and choice of materials, what I call total sensory design, as well as perennially important things such as value and service. I've identified 12 key stages the shopper goes through from leaving the comfort of the couch to returning home, which need to be de-stressed. I begin my work miles away from the site, since research indicates that problems getting to a shopping centre make people regard the whole experience as negative. Too many roundabouts on the drive there are, I've found, stressful for women. They also don't like litter in the surrounding areas. Research has also indicated that people want 25% more space round their cars in the car park to manoeuvre pushchairs and trolleys. In terms of the materials used within a shopping centre, the flooring materials are especially important. Shiny surfaces are out because they can be slippery and make people afraid of falling. I've found that people inevitably gravitate towards natural materials. They may admire plastic and steel for their design qualities, but they develop relationships with stone and wood. They're much more expensive, but I'm convinced that they make people think of a location with them as superior. Now, what if people just feel that a place is not for them? What if the pensioners hate the designer clothes and loud music designed for people in their 20s? Well, I've thought of this problem, of course. In my view, people like to shop with like-minded people, what I call people like us, or PLUs for short. So in the latest shopping centre I've been involved with, shops are grouped in what I refer to as PLU clusters, so that people likely to be drawn to one sort of shop will not feel threatened by people drawn to another. Thus, the centre has the exclusive mall and the discount mall, and shoppers visiting one of them need never meet shoppers going to the other. My research has identified six consumer types. For example, there are those who respond to understated presentation, which enables them to pride themselves on their shrewdness. These I call county classics. Pensioners and people who have stopped competing in their careers fall into another category, home comfortables. Then there are people who look out for some code which tells them a place is for them and not for others. I call them club executives. They want comfort and value, not aesthetics. Another category covers people who don't have huge spending power but always think they're going to find a bargain, the budget optimists. Then there are what I call young fashionables, who lack analytical skills 
but know what they want when they see it and go for it voraciously. And finally, there are couples just married with one income and just about getting by, who I call young survivors. People sometimes ask me if I ever feel guilty about making people spend money they don't want to spend. What I say is that I have a strong aversion to conning people. I believe that to earn money in the retail business, you must give outstanding value. Now that brings me on to my next point, which concerns the general fiscal policy. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. We'll hear part of a radio program about journalists who interview famous people. For questions sixteen to twenty, choose the answer A, B, C, or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have one minute in which to look at part three. Journalism has become a subject for serious study, judging by the number of schools and colleges offering courses and degrees in media studies. Students now write theses on the art of interviewing. We are in something of a mini golden age for the celebrity interview. Just open any British paper or magazine. In Britain, almost every paper has its star interviewer. The bylines are big, the space generous, and the remuneration handsome. Rival papers try to lure away star interviewers, the way they once fought over the big columnist or the voice of sport, knowing that a good interview with a good name sells papers. But who are these interviewers, and how do they do it? I spoke first to Lynn Barber, who's been interviewing famous people or FPs for many years for a variety of national newspapers. Left to myself. I tend to choose interviewees who are male, older than myself, and difficult. I don't mind if they are vain, egotistical, or badly behaved. I avoid nice, sane, straightforward people. My best subjects are the last people on earth you would want to meet at a dinner party. I usually start with a clever, complicated question like, "You said in one paper in 1996, blah blah blah." Whereas you told a magazine in 1998, blah blah blah. This is to let them see that I've done my homework, that I've made an effort, and so should they, and that I won't be fobbed off with old answers. Then I might go on to some soft questions about childhood, finishing with a few more provocative observations, carefully worded, such as, "It seems to me you are very arrogant," just to get them going. For Zoe Heller, each interview is a week's work. It does look like a breeze interviewing one person and taking a week over it. I've got faster, but I still write very slowly. I don't know how people manage without a tape recorder. I couldn't do it. You couldn't possibly get their exact words. I often send them one of my previous pieces in advance, showing them what they're in for, what they can expect. If they agree to see me, I expect them to play the game. There always is a dilemma. I、uh, fret about upsetting people, but at the same time, I want to describe them honestly. 
quite a few people have been upset. I wouldn't be interviewed by me or by anyone. God no, I spend a whole week persuading someone to do something that I wouldn't do myself in a month of Sundays. Angela Lambert, a very experienced interviewer, doesn't use a tape recorder. She makes notes in longhand during the interview. When I arrive, I usually explain that everything that happens belongs to me. Though if they say something is off the record, I won't write it down. If they are nervous, I'll say, "Look, trust me. Otherwise, you won't enjoy it, and I won't enjoy it. If you're really nervous, I'll abandon it. I have no hidden agenda. If, of course, they behave badly and are beastly, I'll write that down. At the end, I say, if they have any regrets, then say it now. They hardly ever take anything back, except trivial things such as perhaps don't mention my brother. <laughs> A great many interviewees mistake intimacy for real friendship. There is reciprocal warmth, which can be very embarrassing, as I'm highly unlikely to see them again. If you are doing an ordinary human interest story, I know that my sympathy will stop the moment the interview is over. They don't realise that, but I feel guilty. If it's a so-called celebrity interview, then that doesn't matter. I don't feel guilty. They know the ropes. Ray Connolly is one of the few male journalists rated by the women in the field. As for my approach, I try to tell a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end in order to make it readable. That's why chat show interviews are so poor. The best bit might be in the first minute or the last minute. With a written interview, you can shape it to get the best effect. If asked, I will let people see the interview, but I don't offer. In thirty years, I've had few complaints. I often protect people from themselves. They don't realise what they say, how things might hurt their children. I like doing writers best. I like actors least. They have nothing to say. Now, as an interviewer myself, this got me thinking. Why is it? Now you'll hear part three again. Journalism has become a subject for serious study, judging by the number of schools and colleges offering courses and degrees in media studies. Students now write theses on the art of interviewing. We are in something of a mini golden age for the celebrity interview. Just open any British paper or magazine. In Britain, almost every paper has its star interviewer. The bylines are big, the space generous, and the remuneration handsome. Rival papers try to lure away star interviewers, the way they once fought over the big columnist or the voice of sport, knowing that a good interview with a good name sells papers. But who are these interviewers, and how do they do it? I spoke first to Lynn Barber, who's been interviewing famous people or FPs for many years for a variety of national newspapers. Left to myself. I tend to choose interviewees who are male, older than myself, and difficult. I don't mind if they are vain, egotistical, or badly behaved. I avoid nice, sane, straightforward people. My best subjects are the last people on earth you would want to meet at a dinner party. I usually start with a clever, complicated question like, "You said in one paper in 1996, blah blah blah." Whereas you told a magazine in 1998, blah blah blah. This is to let them see that I've done my homework, that I've made an effort, and so should they, and that I won't be fobbed off with old answers. Then I might go on to some soft questions about childhood, finishing with a few more provocative observations, carefully worded, such as, "It seems to me you are very arrogant," just to get them going. For Zoe Heller, each interview is a week's work. It does look like a breeze interviewing one person and taking a week over it. I've got faster, but I still write very slowly. I don't know how people manage without a tape recorder. I couldn't do it. You couldn't possibly get their exact words. I often send them one of my previous pieces in advance, showing them what they're in for, what they can expect. If they agree to see me, I expect them to play the game. There always is a dilemma. I、uh, fret about upsetting people, but at the same time, I want to describe them honestly. 
Quite a few people have been upset. I wouldn't be interviewed by me or by anyone. God no. I spend a whole week persuading someone to do something that I wouldn't do myself in a month of Sundays. Angela Lambert, a very experienced interviewer, doesn't use a tape recorder. She makes notes in longhand during the interview. When I arrive, I usually explain that everything that happens belongs to me. Though if they say something is off the record, I won't write it down. If they're nervous, I'll say, "Look, trust me. Otherwise, you won't enjoy it, and I won't enjoy it. If you're really nervous, I'll abandon it. I have no hidden agenda. If, of course, they behave badly and are beastly, I'll write that down. At the end, I say, if they have any regrets, then say it now. They hardly ever take anything back, except trivial things such as perhaps don't mention my brother. <laughs> A great many interviewees mistake intimacy for real friendship. There is reciprocal warmth, which can be very embarrassing, as I'm highly unlikely to see them again. If you are doing an ordinary human interest story, I know that my sympathy will stop the moment the interview is over. They don't realise that, but I feel guilty. If it's a so-called celebrity interview, then that doesn't matter. I don't feel guilty. They know the ropes. Ray Connolly is one of the few male journalists rated by the women in the field. As for my approach, I try to tell a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end in order to make it readable. That's why chat show interviews are so poor. The best bit might be in the first minute or the last minute. With a written interview, you can shape it to get the best effect. If asked, I will let people see the interview, but I don't offer. In thirty years, I've had few complaints. I often protect people from themselves. They don't realise what they say, how things might hurt their children. I like doing writers best. I like actors least. They have nothing to say. Now, as an interviewer myself, this got me thinking: Why is it that I? That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Four consists of two tasks. You will hear five short extracts in which people are talking about people they know. Look at task one. For questions twenty-one to twenty-five, choose from the list A to H what each speaker says is a good characteristic of the person. Now look at task two. For questions twenty-six to thirty, choose from the list A to H what each speaker regards as a bad characteristic of the person. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have forty-five seconds in which to look at part four. Speaker one. James is someone who stands by his friends. Once you're a friend of his, you're always a friend of his. It doesn't matter what you do or what other people say about you. He's a friend for life. We've had our ups and downs over the years, but that's one of the things I really like about him. Strangely enough, though, he has a completely different side to him. And he often comes out with things I would regard as offensive and personally insulting. He's not exactly what you'd call tactful. He just comes right out and says what's on his mind. Speaker two. Nothing phases Alex. Whatever happens, she just takes it in her stride and gets on with life, which is what I really admire about her. She's been through all sorts of changes and problems, 
but she's always managed to do whatever she has to do in the circumstances. She doesn't expect things to go her way or stay the same all the time. There are lots of issues I don't discuss with her, though. She's got her own very fixed opinions, and she simply won't listen to any alternative point of view. Speaker 3 What people don't necessarily notice about Tammy is how sharp she is. She doesn't miss anything, and she can see right through people. When everyone else is talking about something that's happened, she gets straight to the heart of the matter. She's hardly ever wrong either. Of course, most people she knows don't realise this, because she isn't very talkative, and she generally lets other people lead the conversation. If she was more outgoing, didn't hold back so much, people would have a much higher opinion of her. Speaker 4 I know that some people laugh at Jessie and think she's a bit of a fool and, well, she does come out with some outrageous things and make some very public mistakes. But the great thing about her is she never lets any of that get to her. She just carries on believing in herself, never doubting for a minute that what she's doing is the right thing. What I don't like so much, though, is her tendency to have tantrums when things don't go her way. That kind of behaviour is just plain embarrassing for someone of her age. Speaker 5 Chris is one of those people who never gives up. If he wants to do something, he carries on however badly things are going or whatever setbacks he has. I think that's a great strength of his. He never knows when he's beaten. One problem, though, is that he thinks everyone else should do the same, and he never makes allowances for other people's weaknesses. Because he thinks life is tough, and you have to be hard, he has no time for people who complain about their problems. Now you'll hear part four again. Speaker 1 James is someone who stands by his friends. Once you're a friend of his, you're always a friend of his. It doesn't matter what you do or what other people say about you, he's a friend for life. We've had our ups and downs over the years, but that's one of the things I really like about him. Strangely enough, though, he has a completely different side to him, and he often comes out with things I would regard as offensive and personally insulting. He's not exactly what you'd call tactful. He just comes right out and says what's on his mind. Speaker 2 Nothing phases Alex. Whatever happens, she just takes it in her stride and gets on with life, which is what I really admire about her. She's been through all sorts of changes and problems, but she's always managed to do whatever she has to do in the circumstances. She doesn't expect things to go her way or stay the same all the time. There are lots of issues I don't discuss with her, though. She's got her own very fixed opinions, and she simply won't listen to any alternative point of view. Speaker 3 what people don't necessarily notice about Tammy is how sharp she is. She doesn't miss anything, and she can see right through people. When everyone else is talking about something that's happened, she gets straight to the heart of the matter. She's hardly ever wrong either. Of course, most people she knows don't realise this, because she isn't very talkative, and she generally lets other people lead the conversation. If she was more outgoing, didn't hold back so much, people would have a much higher opinion of her. Speaker 4 I know that some people laugh at Jessie and think she's a bit of a fool and, well, she does come out with some outrageous things and make some very public mistakes. 
But the great thing about her is she never lets any of that get to her. She just carries on believing in herself, never doubting for a minute that what she's doing is the right thing. What I don't like so much, though, is her tendency to have tantrums when things don't go her way. That kind of behaviour is just plain embarrassing for someone of her age. Speaker 5 Chris is one of those people who never gives up. If he wants to do something, he carries on however badly things are going or whatever setbacks he has. I think that's a great strength of his. He never knows when he's beaten. One problem, though, is that he thinks everyone else should do the same, and he never makes allowances for other people's weaknesses. Because he thinks life is tough, and you have to be hard, he has no time for people who complain about their problems. That is the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. Then your supervisor will collect all the question papers and answer sheets.